Um, our DAC was formed uh, in 2021 as a merger between the Urban Design um, Committee and the EDC. And we're really just a broad group of interdisciplinary individuals um, that are specifically interested in serving as a forum and a call to action to engage um, community, government leaders, relevant organizations on issues related to the built environment, such as the public realm, urban planning, environmental design, architecture, landscape, architecture, development, transit, housing. Um, that list is not, um, not, not exclusive. So um, we uh, want to uh, serve as a big tent forum to engage and develop allies to speak as one unified voice to improve the San Diego region through advocacy and our combined design expertise. Um, with that, um, I just yeah, want to say welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, this year, we've really um, uh, enjoyed uh, all of the active participation from our different members. Everybody's really stepped up to the plate and been really communicative and um, adding um, help where needed. We actually uh, formed this year three different subcommittees. We formed a design government subcommittee, which is led by Heather and Megan. You'll meet them here in a moment. Um, we formed the upcoming regional developments um, subcommittee and then the world design capital subcommittee. So um, you, for all of uh, the members who expressed interest in a particular subcommittee, uh, you should have received an email from me yesterday if you expressed your interest in the upcoming regional developments subcommittee. So if you didn't receive that email or don't think you did, please check your junk mail. Um, and if you um, still can't find that email, just reach out to me directly and I'll try and resend. We're um, trying to figure out which day we can all meet on a monthly basis uh, for the group. And then you'll be hearing from uh, Megan and Heather in future correspondence for the Design Governance Subcommittee and Lee and Vicki upcoming this month for the World Design Capital. So I just wanted to let you guys know that. So um, with those remarks, I want to make sure to pass it over to Heather and Megan um, to introduce our guest speaker. Great. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, we are so pleased today to have Professor Matthew Carmona with us uh, to present his research and his work on design governance um, as it applies to the UK, where he is, <clears throat> the EU, and then beyond. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, when Heather and I were preparing our work plan for this year as chairs for the new uh, design governance subcommittee, uh, we could not think of a better way to kick off um, our work and our discussion than to have um, the person, Matthew Carmona, who coined the phrase design governance, um, have him present uh, for us what it means, uh, design governance in theory and in practice. And so we're so pleased uh, for today's presentation. Uh, professor Matthew Carmona is an architect, planner, researcher, and professor of planning and urban design at UCL's Bartlett School of Planning in London. He chairs the Place Alliance, an organization that campaigns for place quality in England, and in 2016 was specialist advisor to the House of Lords Select Committee on National Policy for the Built Environment. Uh, most recently, he was a part of the Urban Meister project with UN Habitat and the European Union, looking at new governance strategies for urban design throughout Europe. Um, if you haven't already checked out his blog, um, I highly recommend it. It's a really wonderful resource for uh, research and musings and discussions about design policy at all levels. Um, so I had the pleasure of attending the book launch uh, for his uh, Design Governance, the Cave Experiment book, I highly recommend it, uh, back in 2017 at the Bartlett. Um, and Heather and I have borrowed heavily uh, from this book and his work in general for our white paper on design review in San Diego that we finished a few years ago. Um, as we all know, right now we have such an incredible opportunity in San Diego to craft a truly forward-thinking urban policy um, that addresses these interrelated issues of urban design, climate change, and social inequality in our region. Um, so we're so thrilled to have Professor Carmona here um, and for him to speak with us today. Great, thanks. Well, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Um, let me just share my screen with you. Um, and uh, there we are, it's working. Okay, so while I'm doing that, it, apologies if I'm a bit croaky today. Um, hold on a second, what do I want? I want uh, my agenda now. It's going to be. Um, yeah, I, I uh, after managing to dodge it for two years this morning, I managed to test positive for COVID. So um, I've got a slightly croaky voice, but uh, apart from that, not suffering particularly. Um, all right, so today I'm going to talk about uh, urban design uh, governance. 
And the talk is, the, the, the first part of the talk, the first sort of half of the talk is, is, is a set of concepts, if you like, uh, ideas, um, exactly what this, this concept might mean. And then the second part, uh, the second half, will we'll sort of just look at London briefly um, and uh, show you some of the sort of tools that we might use in, 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 a, in a London uh, context. So uh, first, what does urban design governance mean? Well, urban design governance can be defined as intervention in the means and processes of designing the built environment in order to shape both processes and outcomes in a defined public interest. So this is all about the public sector's role in defining a design agenda, which is in the public interest. And globally, of course, we've been at this a long, long time. You've only got to look at the sort of morphological controls underpinning masterpieces like Siena's uh, Piazza del Campo to, to see what a positive impact the right sorts of rules can have in shaping places. And in modern times, such state intervention in design has increasingly become ubiquitous, you know, globally around uh, the world, instigated for a wide range of predominantly public interest motivations. So there's lots of reasons that the public sector would become involved in design decision making for health reasons, better functionality in cities, uh, economic purposes, uh, to promote places, promote cities, to ensure greater inclusivity in our cities, uh, to protect heritage in our cities, for the social well-being of people, for environmental reasons increasingly we're getting engaged in design, and for aesthetic reasons. Now, so an important point to make at the start is this is not just about what things look like. Fundamentally, it's about the way that cities, urban areas, interact with people uh, and create good places that people can enjoy and engage with day in, day out, and which uh, are good for the environment. Yet increasingly, um, we've seen uh, sort of widespread attempts to influence the design of the built environment that might not necessarily have led to high quality outcomes. Uh, there's been a critique over, over decades that we've not particularly good at shaping our environments, whether we're in uh, North America or Europe or, or anywhere else around the world. Often we create places that are rather placeless. Um, so globally, we're not always very good at meeting these sorts of aspirations that we might have for our cities. Now, what unites all these sorts of placeless places? Uh, well, one major factor certainly seems to be the shaping of cities through crude standards and regulations as a, as a substitute for actually engaging in a place-centered design process. So we have lots and lots of regulations prescribing things like parking norms, road widths and hierarchies, land use density requirements, construction and space standards, highway controls, uh, and so on. And they tend to be quite technical. Uh, they tend to be limited in their scope, technical in their aspiration, not generated out of any place-based vision, but instead generic rules that are imposed upon projects and places, almost without regard to the outcome. So this brings us to the design governance conundrum. Can state intervention in processes of designing a built environment positively shape design processes, processes and outcomes? And if so, how do we go about it? Well, my own research uh, in uh, the UK, you saw this book briefly flashed up earlier, has shown uh, that there is a much wider range of tools with which to influence the design of the built environment than is generally realized. And by tools, I mean uh, the sorts of uh, means by which everyday governance uh, 
occurs in our cities. And the experience across Europe gathered together in, in a project that we recently finished called Urban Maestro um, is suggesting that the cruder regulatory tools um, on which we tend to rely are not necessarily the most effective means to influence design quality. There are, are, are actually some much more effective tools out there to deliver a design quality agenda. So when we examine the tools of urban design and governance, we can make two key distinctions. First, we can distinguish tools by whether they are formal or informal in nature. In other words, between those tools that are legally defined by the state, uh, that are required, in other words, and those that are in some way discretionary, that are therefore optional, we don't have to use them, they're there to use if we wish to. So we can think about formal tools, uh, or rather if we think about formal tools, then um, we really mean tools such as incentives, maybe financial incentives, different types of standards, policies, zoning controls, and different types of plans and codes. Um, and these use hard powers, the hard powers of the state, which are often quite blunt instruments to uh, use in their application. By contrast, if we think about the informal tools, then here we're talking about processes of persuasion, of cajoling, of influencing, informing, advising. And these use soft powers to engage different development decision makers and influencers more directly um, and perhaps in more intelligent ways than some of the harder powers can possibly do. The academic literature tells us that informal tools are particularly valuable to help address some of the most complex of policy problems. Problems, sort of the wicked problems like climate change or public health challenges like obesity. Uh, and certainly the pursuit of design quality, I would say, falls into this category of wicked, complex policy problems. Second, the governance of urban design is as much about shaping the environment within which decisions occur as it is with the processes of actually designing places. Or to put it another way, rather than designing actual things, perhaps buildings or roads or landscape features, a key role of the state is concerned with shaping the decision-making environment in order to positively influence how others make their decisions about design. Um, and so this is a fundamental role of the state and shapes the culture of design uh, that we find in different places. So it's not about the state saying, I'm going to design this building or that building. It's not about the mayor or whoever saying, I'm going to design this or that, but it's about creating the decision-making environment in which better decisions are made, which in turn deliver better quality outcomes, whether it's a building or public space or whatever it is. Now, a European survey as part of the uh, Urban Maestro uh, project that I referred to recently revealed that in, an increasing number of administrations, both national and local across Europe, are developing an increasingly diverse and, and sophisticated set of approaches to engage with design. Now, some tools are what we might call quality culture tools, which seek to establish a positive decision-making environment, that positive decision-making environment in which a consensus, a consensus gradually builds around the notion that a better design built environment delivers value, delivers place value, social value, environmental value, health value um, to citizens and therefore is worth striving for. And there are also what we might call delivery tools, and I'll say more about these in a minute, I'll give you some examples, which steer those decision-making processes in a more focused and directive manner, helping to ensure that 
from intervention to intervention, whatever it might be, the design quality is delivered. So there are tools that are about the culture of design in a place, the culture of design in San Diego, for example, and there are tools that are about delivery, influencing particular decisions about maybe particular projects. And these categories cut across these separate meta categories that I already talk, talked to about briefly around the informal and the formal tools of urban design governance. So in this way, informal tools should be seen as important means to complement the formal side of the urban design governance landscape whatever that might, might be, if there's a zoning ordinance, for example, that uses hard powers and, and for, that's a formal type of tool. And we should be thinking about using the, in, you know, what are the appropriate informal tools to use alongside that to build the culture of design quality uh, in the place. An urban maestro, the, the, the European project also revealed that as well as actual design tools, we can use different types of financial incentivization, part of that package of mechanisms, if you like, to incentivize good design, to reward good behavior, in other words, good design, um, and uh, if possible, to discourage poor behavior, bad design. So building on the earlier work in that book I briefly flashed up in the UK, they these basic distinctions have revealed a sort of typology of European tools of urban design governance. So these different quality culture, quality delivery, informal, formal, deliver sort of nine categories. Uh, so very briefly, what these are, are analysis, different types of analysis that this might involve research about the quality of your built environment. It might, might involve state of the built environment, audits, um, which occur quite regularly in, in some European cities, in, in, in sometimes in whole countries, uh, in Europe, in Germany, for example. So there's different types of analysis tools. Uh, then there's information tools. This is about getting out that design agenda through training, through education, through the creation of practice guides. Again, these are in very informal tools about building this culture of quality telling people what expectations are. And then there are types of persuasion tools, design awards, different types of campaigning that might be done. The Place Alliance, which is an organization that I chair, we do a lot of campaigning around different aspects of design here in England. Uh, and advocacy uh, around the importance of design quality. So those are the first three categories of tool. Then the next three categories are rating tools. This might be things like design competitions or design review. Design competitions are used a lot in continental Europe, not so much here in the UK, but we use a lot of design review. We have design review patterns, particularly in London. I'll say more about that in a minute. Then different types of support. So supplementing local decision-making with particular skilled capacity capacity within municipalities, for example, uh, here in the UK, our municipalities, our local government often struggle, they don't have the right design skills. And there are tools available, uh, or there have been tools available in the past for government to help supplement that design capacity locally. So that's a type of support tool. And then exploration tools. These are things like temporary interventions, as well as charrettes and research by design exercises. These are about experimentation and exploration and about exciting people about the potential of place. And then the last three categories, these go into the formal categories of tools. So urban design frameworks, design co codes, policies and standards. These are all types of guidance, more formal guidance that have a particular status uh, in uh, uh, cities or maybe regions or countries. Forms of incentivization, financial incentivization, regulatory incentivization, such as zoning bonuses, which I know you, you use in, in, in cities across uh, the United States. We don't uh, use the, the, those different mechanisms here. And different types of control mechanisms. Um, which might be just simple traditional development consent regimes, whatever the development consent regime is, 
uh, than that is a traditional control mechanism that can engage with design. So those are the categories of, of, of tools, and all of these tools have a vital role and can be used together to shape high quality places. But what is clear uh, is that the culture of expecting, prioritizing and delivering good design uh, that is behind some of these sort of uh, some of Europe's most successful development projects, places and spaces and indeed cities is underpinned by these sorts of tools. These types of tools underpin some of the most successful projects and successful cities in Europe, both in terms of design, but also in terms of a whole range of other livability measures as well. So this culture is nurtured over time using soft powers of the state, those quality culture tools, backed up and delivered by intelligent application, clear design aspirations, using quality delivery tools, both hard and soft powers. So that, if you like, is the background. That's the, se the, the, the series of concepts. What I want to do in the second part of the talk is just illustrate with the case of London um, and how we use these uh, different tools. So London, since the year 2000, has benefited from strategic citywide government in the form of the Greater London Authority, the executive branch of which is the Mayor of London. And by European standards, the Mayor of London, uh, the, the powers of the Mayor are pretty weak, actually, by most European standards. I mean, they, he doesn't make um, major public investment decisions, that's still made by central government, but the Mayor has, uh, and, and, and the Mayor sort of has to follow national policy, um, but nevertheless, the mayor has significant powers around uh, development management, uh, open spaces, um, around uh, strategic planning within the city, transport, economic development. So the mayor has important powers. And then underneath the mayor are 32 boroughs plus the ancient city of London, right in the middle, there, the square mile. Um, and they each have their own councils and they um, are elected and they also have planning powers, housing powers, um, and they manage many uh, open spaces. They manage local streets uh, and maintain local street, uh, streets and spaces. So there's these different layers, if you like. There's the national layer. Um, then there is the London wide scale, there's that layer, and then there is the local layer. I'm not sure whether you can see this diagram, it might be a bit small, but responsibilities for the governance of urban design in London are split between these different, these, these sort of three tiers of government. As I say, na national, uh, London wide uh, and local government. And each of those tiers uses both formal and informal delivery and quality culture tools of different types. So let's start with the national level. Uh, at this level, policy on design quality has tended to swing quite wild, wildly between support for more or less intervention on design. We've recently been through a period where design was very much off the agenda nationally. And we've moved in the last two years or so into a period where it's really swung very firmly back onto the agenda and design quality is being firmly uh, prioritized again by national governments in a much more hands-on approach. So the latest national planning policy framework, which sets out planning policy for the whole of England, even for example, advocates a drive for beauty beautiful places. We never had that sort of wording in policy ever before. So there's a, there's a real drive to, to, to uh, emphasize design quality. And this national policy is supported by guidance, setting out a series of principles, design principles for establishing the scope of this national concern. So for example, one of the key documents is a national design guide. And this national design guide has uh, what are they? One, two, three, four, five. Has ten principles. Uh, explains these ten principles: uh, context, identity, built form, movement, nature, 
um, public spaces, uses, um, uh, resources, lifespan and homes and buildings. And it, 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 it expands on these and it, and it sets out a series of principles that uh, local authorities up and down the country can choose to adopt. They're the aspirations at the national level for design, if you like. At the national level, we also have a range of executive uh, arms length agencies that government um, or that, that, that help to facilitate the delivery of some of this agenda. So, for example, we have an organisation called Homes England which is responsible for funding social housing across the country. Uh, and that organization uses a tool called Building for Life. This is just an image of Building for Life. That's a, that's a rating system. It rates design according to the, it rates rather schemes according to the design quality. And schemes don't get funding from Homes England unless they meet a certain standard of design quality. So if you like, it's tying that tool, that rating tool to a financial incentive. Uh, and even uh, they, they've even created or in the process of creating a new office for place at the national level, uh, which is set to really drive this agenda forward. We're not quite sure what yet, yet the role of this new office for place is going to be. It's, it's early days yet um, or even how well it's going to be funded. It may not be funded very well. I don't know. Um, but there seems to be certainly a, a, a great interest in national government. At the moment. Turning then to the city-wide scale, while the role of the mayor is a strategic one, each of the three mayors who have been elected since the year 2000 have been interested in issues of design and public realm quality and have used a series of soft and hard powers to, drop, to drive a greater city-wide emphasis on these concerns. And this has been reflected in a comprehensive range of formal design policies in the London plan, uh, the latest uh, example is up there on the screen, um, to which boroughs have to have regard when they create their own local planning policy. Um, and the policy in the London plan is further developed within a whole series of what we call supplementary planning guides, such as this one on the screen here, which deals with character and context, uh, and again, this for, for the London scale sets out those principles, those citywide principles of design. So the, the mayor has to have regard to policies at the England wide scale, and then the mayor sets policies which the local boroughs need to have regard to at the next scale down. But the mayor also has influence through other mechanisms, in particular through Transport for London. Now, Transport for London is the transport agency for the whole of London. Uh, the mayor runs Transport for London. It's very powerful because it has direct responsibility for all the strategic highway routes through the city, but it also funds, or at least part funds, many public realm and street improvements across the city. And so, for example, it has its own rating tool called Healthy Streets Tool, which is a very interesting tool and worth looking at. Um, and before schemes can get funded, they have to have a rating to ensure that they will be healthy places. Um, also, financial incentivization is tied to design review. So any schemes that are, are going to be part funded by the mayor have to go through design review as well. Public realm schemes. Have Transport for London also funds Urban Design London. Urban Design London is, uh, well, it puts on an extensive sort of range of London-wide training programmes for built environment professionals, many of which are focused on design. Um, and the mayor has also recently, uh, the, well, the current mayor has, uh, has appointed what, what are called the Mayor's Design Advocates. There's 50 of these, there's a photograph of them there on the screen. Uh, they deliver design review um, and support local authorities um, and uh, advocate for design quality across the city. So, uh, if you like, uh, he appoints them it, 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 to take to, to, to take the design agenda out across the city uh, and to advocate for it, as well as doing concrete things like design review. Now, although quality aspirations are set from above, 
uh, from the national and the London-wide scale. Much day-to-day -day delivery, particularly as regards regulation, is delivered by the 32 boroughs and the City of London. And they're responsible for managing most non-strategic streets, uh, most public spaces, and the majority of parks across the city. And they're also responsible for establishing local planning policy and conducting development management, as we call it. Um, and are often a major landowners with significant interests in large numbers of development and regeneration projects, including, um, once again, social housing. They, they didn't get involved in social housing for a long time, but they're increasingly getting involved in delivery of social housing uh, again. In recent years, an increasing number of the London boroughs have also, uh, have also required um, that significant schemes, significant development schemes, are subject to design review. Um, and in 2021, there were actually 26 borough-wide design review panels. So not every borough in London has their own panel, but many do, the majority now do. Um, and these then see major schemes, which then go through our development management uh, system. And typically, these are funded by a charge levied for the service by the local planning authority on the private developer. Um, and so uh, the developer pays a charge. That charge either pays for the local authority to set up their own panel and they review directly, or there's a series of non for profit panel managers who uh, have their own panels and design review can be seen by those non for profit uh, organizations. So that's very much a growth area. Now, this strategic drive across London to prioritize design backed up by certain structural advantages the city has over other parts of the UK. Uh, notably, it has higher land values, higher densities, um, supporting you know, more local services and public transport, and a, high, and, and, and a large pool of internationally renowned architects and urban designers, all contribute to a city which tends to score better than other parts of the country in terms of the design quality being delivered in new developments. And this is generally supported by practices at the local borough-wide level, where the scale of development being delivered has meant that generally, although certainly not always, London's boroughs have been better resourced in terms of planning and built environment services with more quali qualified urban designers um, and preparing more design codes and conducting more design review than anywhere else in the country. So these formal and informal tools, in fact, were revealed by a study that uh, I recently authored uh, called um, the uh, Housing Design Audit. We audited design quality across the country, across England, and found that London was scoring much better than the rest of the country in terms of design, design outcomes. Although even the most rigorous systems um, have rather markedly varying results. So, so even the, all of the right processes in place doesn't necessarily mean you're going to always deliver great quality outcomes. Rather poor quality design on the left, uh, uh, and right next to that, uh, a very nice quality scheme uh, on the right in part of uh, the East End of London. Ultimately, the governance of design in London is a shared endeavor shared between tiers of government, as well as with private and third sector interests, with some decisions even working their way through all of those three tiers. So for example, we had a recent project that was proposed in London called the Tulip, which is this building you can see by, uh, by Foster and Partners. It was a 300 meter high visitor attraction, um, which, was finally rejected just in 2001 by the government who made the final decision, um, but only after it had also been rejected by the mayor and then appealed to the government because the original decision was made by the City of London and they approved it. So decisions can sometimes go through all, tier, all three tiers of government. So I suppose one of the key things that I want to emphasize is that there are more tools than are often recognized in the urban design governance toolbox. 
An analysis in the UK and across Europe has tended to reveal that the that those responsible should fully embrace both the informal as well as the formal modes of design governance and should consider such processes to be part of the long-term and necessary societal investment in place. And failing to do so means that those who are responsible for shaping the quality of the built environment are typically doing so with one hand tied behind their back. And this is particularly so when it comes to shaping that all important decision making environment, uh, which uh, I refer to, and which helped to shape the decisions about individual projects uh, and places. So if you're interested in anything I've said, I hope some of it made sense. Uh, if you're interested, then you can certainly read more uh, about it. Uh, you can go to the Urban Maestro website, where there's lots of examples of the use of informal tools uh, across Europe, or you can go to my website there at the bottom, where, which has my blog on it, but also has a whole range of articles that you can download, including uh, recent articles on uh, design governance. So thanks very much uh, for listening to me. Uh, hopefully there's some time left for us to have some discussion. So I'll stop sharing there. Thank you so much, Matthew. That was a, a great presentation. Um, well, it looks like we right off the bat have a question um, from Vicky in the chat um, regarding um, the way London's set up and wondering if the process is appealable. Can, yeah, can I clarify that a little bit more, Katie? And yes, that absolutely. That uh, you've, got, you've got all these levels, Matthew. And what if at the lower level, I mean, you know, the, it didn't go quite the way that the developer wanted. And uh, that lower level said, no, you, you've got to design this, this way. And it would cost him three times as much to do it. Can he or he or she appeal the process up the ladder? Or is that it? They got to do what that lower level says. No, so the, the example I gave you there at the end with the that tower that was designed by Norman Foster, that is exactly what happened. It was a they, they applied to the City of London. The City of London said yes, but they said yes, you can build it. But in that case, um, the mayor of London said, I want to look at this because I don't think it's a good quality scheme. And the mayor of London has the right to call in certain developments. So the mayor of London then said, looked at it, and the mayor of London then said no. Uh, and the developer then appealed to the Secretary of State, which is the national government. So uh, that's unusual, but typically what happens if, if a developer doesn't get the decision at the local authority level, the first level that they want, then they can appeal direct to the Secretary of State, which is the national government level. There's, an, there's a thing called the planning inspectorate, which then makes that decision. Thank you very much. Well, since there's no other questions, let me ask let me, let me ask one more question. Please. Do you find what you presented, London specifically, is it is it working well, or are there are there parts of it that eh, you know it, it could work better? The reason I ask, I mean, I wish we had a, a the same kind of process here. I mean, based on what you talked about, I mean, it's amazing, and all the local you know the borough people, mayors, leaders, whatever. I mean, that that, that does not happen here. We have community planning groups, but they don't, you know, they can improve or, you know, reject a project, but that's, you know, clearly appealable all the way up and everything could be denied all the way up to planning commission, but they go up to city council and they, you know, no matter what everybody else said, the city council could approve it. So that, that, that's kind of a problem here. I don't, and anybody shaking their head? Yes, no. But uh, um, that's the way the process works here in San Diego. And I'm wondering if... if uh... Yeah, I mean, I, I think the process here is not quite as rosy as perhaps I, the, the picture I painted. In, in, in that it is a bit variable. It depends where you are. And some boroughs in London, some of the local boroughs, take design more seriously than others. Some take it very seriously indeed and have a great track, track record of delivering very high quality developments. Okay. Uh, others, not so much. Um, and so, yeah, there, there is quite a lot of variation. Ultimately, the final decision maker in terms of the formal process is the Secretary of State. And if the Secretary of State makes a decision, then you can't go beyond that. Well, you could go to, you could challenge it in the court, but only on a particular legal point, but that rarely happens. Okay. 
Thank you, Matthew. I, I have a, a question, and I guess just listening to the presentation and then the comment you just made to Vicki, what is the, the, the community support that generates the process that people go along with? with they want to have this process to look at what, what happens in their neighborhood or in their community. Yeah, generally, there is a big concern amongst communities about what is happening within their neighborhood. Um, and, you know, on the areas adjacent to their neighborhood. And so, for example, we recently, the, the current government tried recently to introduce a new planning act across the country, which was designed deliberately to reduce the amount of power that local authorities had, you know, the local government level. Um, and there was a huge stink. I mean, there was a great national bun fight. And, event, uh, and eventually they've had to back down um, because communities are just really passionate about actually we want to have development which is you know of a good quality in our localities Now that's not every community and and it tends to be the more affluent communities that tend to be more passionate than the others because perhaps they've they've got more time on their hands to to be passionate about these things and they're not so worried about other day-to-day uh, -day issues um, but nevertheless there is a sort of there is a sort of a, a drive nationally to engage with these issues, I suppose, at the local Very level. much parallel to the American model, I think. That's uh, yeah. Like other questions, comments. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. My question is mainly regarding design review. It was something that you mentioned several times throughout your presentation as one of the tools that we have. And it's something that has been discussed in this Regional Design Advisory Council internally as is this something we could accomplish here in San Diego. One of the major factors that we get when we talk about design review in front of the planning department or city officials is how does this not hold up the process? Because it's all about you know, getting things done quickly and already there appears to be many roadblocks in the process for permitting um, a project. So I was curious as to your perspective and how important is design review as one of those tools, basic tools, and then also in your experience and, and looking at how effective these tools are, um, do you see that design review tends to add time to the process or bureaucracy, or does it in fact improve it? Yeah, so I've done a number of studies on design review over the years. Um, and my experience is quite the opposite, that actually it speeds up the process because through design review, um, if it's a good design review panel, you're improving the quality of the development, you, ideally early on in the process. Um, and you're getting a greater, um, if you like, consensus early on in the process. And that helps to overcome the roadblocks that otherwise you get further down the line. Um, so we tend to find that design review actually speeds up the process rather than, than slowing it down. Um, it also has another really beneficial effect, which is in this country, one of the key challenges is getting local authorities to approve new housing schemes, particularly on the edge of developments, because people living on the edge of development, quite right, you know, they, they don't really like somebody building next, next to the, on the, the green fields right next to them. But design review, by helping to improve the quality of design, generally helps to build consensus about the importance of new development in localities and about the importance of design quality. So it can help to build community support around, the, around development, around the need for development. And, and we, like you, um, have a, a dire need for new housing, uh, lots of new housing. But uh, and the government has finally, the pennies finally dropped with our government, which is, is not just about numbers, it's also about quality. Matthew, in San Diego, we have design review boards, um, different areas, different cities. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of that is done by lay people, non-professionals. Oftentimes they don't even know what they're looking at or commenting on, on complex projects. In the boroughs, is that, how is that handled? Is that handled by professional input? Or is that yeah. community? Yeah, it's, it's, it's handled by... 
So here's the model. Here the model is that. It, it, Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I think we kept on talking over each other. Uh, here the model is that um, it's it's professional, professionally done, um, and paid for. Now, it wasn't always that way. There was a tradition of local authorities having uh, panels, sometimes community-based panels, but often panels of just sort of local architects who gave up their time for free to be on these panels. But increasingly, over the last 10 years, it's become professionalised. Most panels, almost all panels, are paid for. The developer pays a fee, as I mentioned, and that fee, a proportion of that fee goes to the panel members who are all professionals. Um, and a proportion goes to the either the local authority or the organization that manages uh, the panel. And it, it works extremely well. And the again, my research has tended to show that overall you get uh, you know, much better design quality as a result of a design review. I mentioned that piece of research that we did, that national audit of design quality. We audited 142 major, large new development projects up and down the country. And then we correlated those that had scored well in urban design criteria against those which had gone through a design review process. And you saw a direct correlation. Those that had gone through design review were, were coming out much, you know, much better in terms of the design outcomes. Also, those that had used the design code were coming out much better as well. So I'd like to ask you a question, Matthew. Um, how best can non-governmental advocacy play a direct role in influencing the creation of the public sector's government structure? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, it, we went through a period when, we've been through a period uh, from oh, 2010 on with 2008 on, there was the financial crisis, then there was a period of austerity, cuts, 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 in this country. Um, we had a whole infrastructure, design governance infrastructure at the national level, and that was completely cut out. Um, and th so there was a dearth of national leadership on design. And back in, I think it was 2014, I and some others started this organization called the Place Alliance. You can look at our website. And the Place Alliance was essentially a it's not even a not-for-profit, it's just a network of, of people and organisations that are passionate about the quality of our built environment and got together to advocate to government, to local government, to others about the importance of design quality. And we started off by doing, we did big events, we called them big meets and, and we, we got everybody together in a room. Um, we we, we utilised the university's space um, and we, we, we got all sorts of people together to discuss this sort of dearth of leadership nationally. We invited politicians, we invited civil servants, we conducted pieces of research, um, we uh, you know, you know, visited people and advocated and gradually, gradually, gradually design quality came back on the agenda. Now, I'm not saying it was all down to us, but um, it, it certainly, I think, non-for-profits and just sort of um, volunteer organizations can have a really, really positive influence, I think. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure the Place Alliance will be very helpful for us as we go forward uh, as we address that question. Thank you. Hi, uh, I think I'm next. Yes. I'm Howard Blackson. Okay, thanks. Um, I just got a meeting. Is this? Uh, thank you for the presentation, and, and also thank you all. Thank you, uh, Megan, and and uh, for putting making the uh, design review a big uh, issue and a big topic for San Diego to raise the bar. I'm, I'm thankful. My question is: is is this linked to the building better, building beautiful, Roger Scruton um, 
uh, blow up of a few years ago and, and, and your thoughts on where it came from. And I'll just say, I'm a University of Westminster alum, Princess Foundation internship. Leon Creer uh, uh, is a, my guru. So uh, any thoughts on where this came from and did it come from that? So you're, so you're sympathetic to that whole side of thing. Yes, we had, we had a, um, a commission set up, what was it, uh, three years ago, called the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission. And that was the first, uh, not quite the first, but almost the first inkling that the government, national government, were getting interested in design again. And they set this thing up and they put Roger Scruton, who, who passed away a year or so ago, uh, but a uh, philosopher, uh, in charge of this thing. And it spent a year, it produced a report, it's a very interesting report. Uh, I don't agree with everything in it, but I think there's a lot of very interesting ideas in there. But I think what it has done is it, it has, it's put design uh, sort of center stage within, at least within some departments of national government, not, not across the whole thing, but certainly in some. Um, and the office for place, which I referred to, is the thing which is being set up to take some of those recommendations forward of, of the Building Better Building Beautiful Commission. There's been a bit of a hiatus the last year or so, but I think they're about to announce some, some of the results of what's happening and how the office of place is going to be set up and so forth. Um, and there's been a big drive also as part of that, but also related to some things that happened before, on the use of design codes in particular, design codes as we call them, um, as a particular tool which our housing audit showed to be very effective at delivering better quality design. Um, and so national government have been running this whole process of trialling design codes. I've been monitoring and evaluating it. And um, so that, that's also related to the Building Better Building Beautiful Commission. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Carmona, for this. This has been absolutely fantastic. And I think so many of the things you have mentioned are things that we are currently discussing in various um, ways in the city right now. <clears throat> but I had a question about, you know, just thinking about this world design capital that's coming up for us in the next two years. Um, and, you know, having this kind of opportunity right now with the makeup of our, you know, our mayor, our city council, um, you know, what kind of, easy wins, you know, thinking about kind of not easy wins, but, you know, to start this project, to really introduce and, you know, really double down on this idea about design in the city. Um, and so I'm very interested in that um, Mayor Khan's design advocates as something that he chose to do as a conduit. Um, and then also kind of the move right now with the city architect, you know, many cities um, in Europe, I mean, Malmo just hired, you know, the public practice founder from London, you know, just th there's kind of this move towards, you know, creating positions you know, for us locally, uh, Christopher Hawthorne in LA as the chief design officer um, kind of has put design back on the table in many ways there. So, uh, you know, just from your research in, in the EU and the UK, you know, how do you see the role of the city architect? You know, have you seen that as, as successful or as uh, another roadblock or ineffectual, just kind of from your research? No, our, our urban maestro uh, work shows that um, uh, city architects and the, the, the they come in various guises and, and various structures, um, are very effective at raising this quality culture that I, that I talked about. It's about ultimately, are you a city that wants to see good design quality, good urban design, or are you a city that's not too bothered about it? And if you're not too bothered about it, you're going to get any, any old stuff. If you are bothered about it, then you need to consistently advocating for that and a, a city architect is the person who can do that from within so it's all very well being outside and advocating what you know what the mayor should do and that's an important role but actually having somebody inside the tent can be very very powerful indeed and certainly in Europe uh, in continental Europe that is a model which is used a lot less so I have to say in the UK um, but um, yeah, we, we have other uh, ways of, of, of dealing with some of those uh, agendas. Hey Matthew, my name is Dirk Sutro and thank you for a 
thank you for a wonderful and inspiring presentation and for for braving your your COVID test to show up. And it makes me feel good that you made it through a, a whole hour. You look very coherent and healthy. So that, <laughs> that, all, that all bodes well. Um, my career has been mostly as a journalist in the realm of arts and architecture. And I'm thinking there's such a huge gap between good ideas, you know, thoughtful ideas that, that, that you're telling us about today and public awareness and engagement. And I'm, I'm wondering what you would say about the role of media in this whole mix and what you could tell us about the willingness and resources that media, either where you are or in the US, whatever you know about it, how much willingness is there and how important are media to this whole shebang? Well, here, media is important if you want to make national politicians sit up and take notice. <laughs> so, for example, this the, the, the housing audit I mentioned, we got the BBC involved um, and they reported on it quite widely. Um, and also the Guardian newspaper. And, uh, and ever since I've seen this, this housing audit mentioned by ministers, it's mentioned by civil servants, um, whereas a lot of research which I do is never, you know, nobody ever reads it apart from me and probably a couple of other people. Um, so it can be obviously really, really important, but it's, it's, it's difficult, I think, to get national media or even citywide media really interested in these issues of design quality and planning and even development so you know how do you go about that is it, it's not easy um i would say this you've got this thing coming up this sort of uh, city of design you know that seems to be a golden opportunity to I don't know, maybe a little bit, a bit, a little bit of embarrassing the city might need to be done, you know, to say, well, you know, we've got this, you know, it needs to involve the built environment. The built environment is an important dimension of design. Um, and, you know, maybe start by embarrassing and then build from there. I, mean, I think, you know, if you want media involved, the media are only interested if you're trying to embarrass someone. <laughs> They're not interested in a good news story um, or not, not very often anyway. Um, but, uh, you know, it, 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 what you need is, is one organisation that's willing to do the embarrassing and another organisation that's willing to do the sort of building and, and, and more positive advocacy. And you need to hit your mayor or whoever from, from you know, a, a, a pincer movement. Um, yeah, but it's not easy. Are there any other questions? Any last questions while we have Matthew? Yeah. Hi, I'm Phil Bona. Um, I'm an architect and planner in uh, the San Diego area. Um, has uh, two questions? Has London been uh, uh, received the uh, world ca uh, design capital distinction yet? No, no I'm not familiar with uh, the all of the different cities that have. But um, and I don't know how much you know about it. But the San Diego no, was selected. Yeah, I've never the, heard of it until Megan mentioned it. So. Yeah, San Diego <laughs> was selected for the 2024 World Design Capital um, recognition. And I, I wonder what coming, you know, living your world in, in London, and, and if, if you were to have that opportunity to be distinguished as the World Design Capital, what would you do? What, what thoughts might you have about um, being a you know a world class city and and having design and creativity be at the forefront of what makes in our case San Diego, at least in twenty twenty four, perhaps the best city in the world. Well, I think I think it's about being bold. I mean, I think mayors love to have bold projects to show people. Um, I think. I know you love your cars, but um, I think, you know, you need to think about how you're going to deal with that particular hot potato uh, and having, you know, maybe a day or two where people leave their cars at home and, um, you know, walk the city streets or cycle the city streets might be a, a, a nice thing to do. But I think those sorts of things, those sort of initiatives, which, you know, it, it's about building up ahead of steam. Um, 
with small starting small but things that a mayor can then come along and open and and, and say isn't this great and, and point to it and say right well you know san diego it's not just about design in whatever tech field we're talking about but it's actually design in the built environment in the places that people live and that are so important to people good thank you You know, like I just getting on to that, and, and the World Design Capital, it starts now, it's not 2024. And a recent op-ed in the paper by Mary Walshock from UCSD and Roger Scholey said our charge is to up our game in urban design and architecture, uncloud transportation networks, and deal with the natural environment. All those 10 points or so that you had on one of your earlier slides, Matthew. And I think that's the charge that this group has, is to start getting more active about promoting these ideas and some of the things and being the advocates that uh, Matthew talked about and bringing back the discussion on design and raising the consciousness in San Diego and, you know, putting design back in the planning department and into the city. Fantastic. Howard. Thank you. Uh, follow on Mike's point though, the MBs and the young people today see design and beauty as expensive and uh, and exclusive are you experiencing any of that when you in, in the public backlog to this because yeah we all uh, we all know that design is great because we're a bunch of designers but uh um there is a true backlash especially in california of of uh, the cost of living and adding to that cost of living even though we know that might not be necessarily true we do charge fees. So I'm curious what, what's going on there with that in that regard. Yeah, I've always been a bit hesitant to use the word beauty because I think it, I, you know, I've spent whatever, 25 years trying to persuade people that actually the, the design of the built environment is not just about the way places look. Now that, that's important. I'm not saying it's not important, but it's actually much, much more than that. It's about the way we experience and use spaces and so forth, and the way we interact with each other and interact with the environment and cars and move and, and cities and so forth. And so I, I think there's a much bigger agenda here than beauty, but nevertheless here, the government has, has latched onto this beauty agenda. Um, and they see it as, an important way of making development more palatable locally to local communities, particularly those communities. Um, we, have the, we have national volume house builders here who produce the most awful houses up and down the country. Um, and the idea of beauty is, is, is being promoted by the government as, as trying to move beyond that. And they, they say, right, well, we have a bigger agenda for beauty. Beauty doesn't just mean aesthetics, but nevertheless, I, I think it's a slightly problematic term myself. Interestingly, the EU has started using the term beauty as well. In it. They've got this initiative called the uh, New European Bauhaus. And beauty, there's beauty, sustainability, and inclusiveness. I think those are the three terms that they're using to, to drive that initiative forward. So beauty is definitely uh, on the agenda, but it, it, it's not the be all and end all. Sorry, I didn't answer your question. I forgot what your question was. What was your question? <laughs> the question was, is are you getting a backlash of putting, uh, of, of advocating for design as being expensive with the young people today who are priced out of pretty much everything? No, not. Not, not in relation to the beauty agenda, I think. I've not certainly not noticed that. Um, I think my, my argument has always been that good design doesn't cost more. Um, and I've done research, you know, starting right back in 2000, we did a piece of research called The Value of Urban Design, uh, which you can still download. And that, that looks to trace, actually, if you design places well in good urban design, actually, there's a economic premium for developers as well as a premium for society as well. So good design doesn't cost more. And I'm not talking here about gold plating taps and things. It's, it's about, you know, um, it's about getting the streets right, connecting to, neighbor, to, to surrounding neighborhoods. All those fundamental design things that we so often get wrong, but, and don't cost us more to get right. 
I just want to step in here and um, uh, we'll we'll wrap up. Um, we know we uh, went a, went a little bit over your time, but thank you so much. You provided so many ideas that will serve to inspire us as we seek this year to um, move forward. Not just uh, have presentations, but we want to take action based on the ideas presented. And you've served as such a, a good start, the good first presentation of the year. So thank you so much, Matthew, for for being with us, and thanks to all the attendees and the good questions. Pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. Absolutely. Talk to you guys next month. Bye-bye.